Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to deal with antisocial behaviour on quad bikes. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, section 126 of the Antisocial Behaviour etc. Scotland Act 2004 provides powers for the police to seize vehicles being used in a manner causing alarm, distress or annoyance. Uh, the Scottish Government supports the work of Police Scotland to deal with vehicles that are being used antisocially. Local community policing teams are ideally placed to engage with members of the community to identify areas causing concern which can be prioritised for pro proactive patrols uh, to prevent repeat instances of such behaviour and deal with any offences. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for the answer. Um, not only is antisocial behaviour happening in farmland and grassland, it's increasingly a nuisance and a threat on pavements and in urban streets. Um, I recognise the Minister is new into the post and I, I wish him well in his new role. But is the Government open to the option of strengthening fixed penalty notices to deal with this problem and to give the police more tools in the box? Minister. Well, I would, I would certainly be happy to have a discussion with uh, Claire Baker on these issues. If there's any uh, proactive ideas that she can bring forward uh, to tackle this issue, it's worth stressing that you know, we do have specific offences which can be uh, taken forward in terms of activities that are happening off-road and indeed those on-road, depending on which section of the Act, the uh, uh, Road Traffic Act 1988 applies. Um, so there are things that can be done. The police, we know the police can proactively uh, patrol areas to make sure they clamp down on, on antisocial behaviour, but I'm willing to listen to any positive ideas that uh, members can bring forward and happy to meet Claire Baker on that basis. Question number two, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making on tackling rural crime. Cabinet Secretary, <coughs> Michael Mathis. Tackling crime, including rural crime, is an operational matter for Police Scotland. Uh, local policing remains the bedrock of Police Scotland's activities and has, been, and, and has been strengthened under the single service. Now, all 14 divisions have a designated local commander to work with communities, councils and other partners to shape and deliver local policing. The Scottish Government funds Neighbourhood Watch Scotland and its well-respected alert system that allows individuals, businesses, Police Scotland and other agencies to share general safety messages and alerts. Farm Watch and Rural Watch areas across Scotland enable specific alerts about thefts, appeals for information and messages relating to work being carried out on and around farms to be shared quickly and easily. Mr Ferguson. Um, thank you. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary uh, for his response, and may I congratulate him on his elevation to the Cabinet. Um, despite the, the figures that he's given, the fact is that rural crime cost Scotland almost £2 million in 2013. Ayrshire seemed to be a particular hotspot, um, costing the local economy very nearly half a million in that same year. Just last weekend, there was a theft of goods worth £6,000 from a farm near Hoyk. Oil, tools, and particularly quad bikes, uh, machinery and garden equipment seem to be the top items that, that are targeted. Now, obviously, in rural areas, greater geographical distances and a lower concentration of police resources make tackling rural crime more difficult. So, on top of the steps that the, 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 minister, the Cabinet Secretary has detailed, can I ask what further the government might do to try to ensure that these barriers of rurality, if you like, are overcome? Cabinet Secretary. I, I do appreciate that there are specific aspects around uh, uh, policing within rural areas that create additional challenges. Uh, which are important. And one of the things that I'm uh, keen to see the Scottish Police Authority considering is how, given the data which we've received this week, which shows that crime in Scotland is at a 40-year low, there are areas within that data identified where there has been an increase in particular types of crime, the very types of crime that the member makes reference to. And in my discussion with Vic Emery, who is the chair of the Scottish Police Authority yesterday, I was keen to explore with them how they will then reflect that in their policing strategy at a localised level, reflecting on that particular uh, data. And I'm uh, keen to make sure that the local policing plans, which we now have for all 32 of our local authority areas and also the local scrutiny committees within local authority areas, have a role to play in considering this type of data and to then look at how that can then be reflected in future policing plans within the local area in order to reflect the particular rural dimension, but also to reflect the particular needs within that community in itself. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. While local policing plans are good and well, there are concerns that there are insufficient specialist wildlife crime officers in Scotland. In conversations in your new post, Cabinet Secretary, with the SP and Police Scotland, can you raise these concerns, particularly with the Chief Constable? Cabinet Secretary. Well, tackling wildlife crime, of course, is a, a very important issue, and there is a, a, a team within Police Scotland uh, of officers who have uh, specialisms uh, within this particular 
uh, field. If the member has uh, some specific suggestions that she feels that the Scottish Police Authority should be considering, along with uh, Police Scotland, um, I'd be more than happy to consider them uh, 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 as well. But it's important we make sure uh, that we take forward a whole range of measures that can help to uh, reduce um, uh, wildlife crime. And there are already a certain range of measures which are presently uh, in, in place in order to look at how we can build on that uh, in the work that's been done over uh, recent years. But if the member has got some specific suggestions that she feels could assist in tackling wildlife crime much more effectively, then I'd be more than happy to uh, hear from the member and to consider how the Police Authority could look at taking these forward. Question number three, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what the economic benefits of immigration from the European Union are to Scotland. Minister Hamza Yusuf. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of migration for healthy population growth and sustainable economic growth as well. Uh, EU migrants play a valuable role in our economic prosperity and will always be welcome in Scotland. The UCL report, report from earlier this month uh, made the value of EU migrants clear. It found between 2001 and 2011 recent European migrants made a net contribution to the UK economy of £20 billion. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Minister very much for that response. And my understanding is that there are certain sectors in our economy which are very dependent uh, on uh, folk from overseas, including the European Union. And would he join me in deploring the anti-immigration hysteria which has been encouraged by some political parties? Minister. The member makes an absolutely valid point. Where concerns and tensions over migration exist, yes, we have a duty to address them. Uh, but politicians must not be tempted uh, to use inflammatory rhetoric in the pursuit of cheap political gain. Uh, disheartened and angry is how I felt when I read the comments from UK Defence Secretary Michael Fallon talking about towns and cities being swamped and under siege from immigrants. We must all condemn such distasteful language, which frankly is out of the British National Party's handbook. Immigrants do contribute. They contribute culturally, they contribute socially, and they even contribute, thank God for it, through their cuisine. So EU migrants and many others are very, very welcome to Scotland indeed. Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. I fully recognise the many benefits that immigration has brought to Scotland, especially from Eastern Europe, uh, to the tourism, tourism industry, especially in my region of the Highlands and Islands. But does the Minister agree with me that it's paramount that we ensure we have a fair immigration system favouring those who want to come here to work hard and contribute to Scottish society rather than those who only wish to reap benefits. Minister. You know, I, I don't see anybody and never come across a politician or a political party that's advocated for illegal immigration. Uh, all of us want to clamp down on those who choose to abuse the system. That is absolutely correct. But we must understand that being part of the European Union, for every person that comes from Eastern European to work here, of course, we have a Scot that has a retirement villa in the Costa del Sol. And so it's a two-way process, and we enjoy that two-way process. But I agree with the member. There's vital sectors uh, that need immigration. The UK government's immigration rules are completely counterproductive to filling those skills gap. That is why the Institute of Directors, the STUC and University Scotland uh, we're asking and requesting some uh, measure of devolve or devolution over immigration. We'll chew over what the Smith Commission has said uh, over that and the, as part of the issues of further consideration. I'm sure the member uh, for the geography that he represents will wish to make further representation uh, on that too. Question number four, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has in respect of the non-domestic rate system. Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney. So this government remains committed to maintaining the most competitive tax environment available anywhere in the United Kingdom. Gavin Brown. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and also uh, congratulate him on his new uh, role as Deputy First Minister for Scotland. Um, does the Scottish Government support a continuation of the below inflation cap on the increase for non-domestic rates? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, can I thank Mr Brown for his kind remarks, which are, 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 are greatly appreciated. Uh, in relation to the um, approach on business rates, the Government remains committed to, the, um, to two things. Uh, first of all, to updating business rates in line with the September RPI figures, which is the normal metrics by which this is undertaken, um, but also to ensuring that the uh, business rates poundage in Scotland is equal to that south of the border, and that will be the approach that the Government takes in any future decisions. Question number five, Kevin Stewart. 
President, officer, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with the integration of health and social care. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act came into effect in April 2014. A full public consultation on the regulations and orders that support the Act has been conducted. These regulations and orders have now been laid with the Scottish Parliament and are due to come into effect in December. Partnerships are currently developing their integration schemes and these must be submitted to the Scottish Government by 1 April 2015. Kevin Stewart. Thank you. Uh, in Aberdeen, we have seen a dramatic rise in delayed discharge since the inception of the arm's length company Bonacord Care. When the SNP were in power in Aberdeen, delayed discharges were at zero. Does the Minister foresee any problems with the integration of health and social care in areas where councils have passed the delivery of care on to arm's length companies? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I first of all say to the member that he can be assured that delayed dis discharge is absolutely my uh, top priority uh, going forward. Uh, it is obviously up to local partnerships to, to take a collective view on the provision of health and social care services uh, delivered in their area. I am sure that the member will be aware that one of the, the key problems in Aberdeen with delayed discharge is the fact that um, the, the challenges of over-recruitment and retention of staff uh, to deliver that care. We know that Aberdeen is a, an area of, of low unemployment with a, a strong economy and there are significant challenges in being able to attract potential employees uh, to that sector. One of the things I can tell that the member around he, he, about, he may well be aware of the discussions that are happening between NHS Grampian and Aberdeen City Council who are working together to identify land assets that could be developed as low-cost affordable housing to help with that ongoing recruitment problem in the area. That's certainly something I'm very keen that uh, both organisations pursue, and it's something I've asked to be kept up to date with uh, on a regular basis. Neil Findlay. In, uh, integration of health and social care is vital for dealing with uh, delayed discharge, but given the crisis in local government finance, where on earth are councils expected to find the match funding demanded in the First Minister's statement of yesterday? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, local government has received a higher percentage share uh, of funding than happened under the previous Labour administration. But what I can say uh, to Neil Finlay is the critical element here is the integration of health and social care. For, for too long, uh, health and uh, and local governments have uh, had their, their, their budgets in two separate silos, working in two separate silos, and in between those silos are the vulnerable elderly people, <coughs> in many cases, who um, are not getting the service um, and the quality of service that they require. Integration is absolutely critical to address that and bringing those two resources together, significant resources, if I can say to Neil Finlay, <clears throat> that the joint resource that health and social care will have uh, going forward from April next year amounts to £7.6 billion. That is a huge resource. <clears throat> but what's important is how they spend that resource. And I'm absolutely uh, um, clear that I expect both of those organisations to make sure they make the improvements that they require to be made. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the delayed discharge problems in NHS Ayrshire and Arran and the shortage of available beds at the moment, without the winter bugs having yet kicked in. Does she share my concern about the situation in Ayrshire, and will she, as a matter of urgency, raise this problem with NHS Ayrshire and Arran with a view to finding a solution? Well, if I can say to, to John Scott, um, all of the health boards uh, are under no illusion about the priority that we give tackling delayed discharge. But of course, the, the solution to tackling delayed discharge doesn't just lie within the health service. It is absolutely uh, about the health service working with local government to address that. And those partnerships have been working very, very hard to address some of the short-term challenges of winter pressures. And we absolutely know that those are indeed uh, big challenges. But going forward, the plans that are beginning to be put in place around those partnerships from April going forward are absolutely critical to this. We need to redesign many of those services. We need to avoid people turning up 
to hospital when they don't need to be there. We need to uh, have far better uh, alternatives, particularly for those vulnerable elderly people, for many of whom uh, an acute hospital setting is not the right one. So I can give the member an absolute assurance that this is my key top priority going forward, and I'd be very happy to keep him uh, up to date about developments in his area. Question six, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its legacy plans from the Commonwealth Games. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government and our legacy partners are working to capitalise on the opportunities brought about by hosting the best Commonwealth Games ever. In the days following the Games, £6 million was announced towards Scotland's first ever dedicated para sports centre, as well as a further £2 million to build on and deepen the legacy which is already delivering benefits nationwide. A further £50 million will be invested by Sports Scotland in the Active Schools programme over 2015 to 2019, significantly increasing opportunities for children to participate in sport across the whole of Scotland. More recently on Tuesday, the opening of a new track at Grangemouth Stadium using the track utilised at Hamden Park now means young people can train on this very same track used by Ailey Child and Usain Bolt, inspiring the next generation of champions. A full economic assessment of the Games will be published in the spring. A recent analysis points to £282 million being spent by visitors to the Games. A post-Games legacy evaluation report assessing progress towards legacy outcomes will be published in July 2015. James Dornan. I thank the Minister for that comprehensive response and congratulate him on his, uh, his well-deserved new position as a Minister. Uh, my own constituency of Glasgow Cathcart has a number of interesting legacy projects ongoing, including a plan, a plan to turn the disused St Martin's Church in Castlemilk into the Cathkin Braes Mountain Bike and Activity Centre. Can I ask the Minister if a, he will come and visit the site of the proposed centre and meet those involved with the proposal, and b, what assistance is the government giving or intending to give to local and community projects to assist them with such legacy building in the local community? Uh, Briefly, well, can I, Minister. Can I thank Mr Dornan uh, for his uh, uh, welcome. Uh, President Officer, having delivered the most successful Commonwealth Games ever, we are uh, determined to secure uh, its legacy. And communities across Scotland are obviously interested in playing their part in securing uh, the Games' legacy. I would encourage communities across Scotland to visit the Legacy website to find out more about some of the ongoing sources of support, such as the Legacy 2014 Active Places Fund and Legacy 2014 Sustainable Sport for Communities Fund. I am very delighted to learn of the efforts in Glasgow Cathcart. I wish those involved well, and of course I will be happy to visit with Mr Dornan. Thank you. Question number seven, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its policy is on the development of energy storage technologies. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, President Officer, energy storage can help us make the most effective use of Scotland's energy resources. Pumped hydro plays a vital role in meeting UK energy security, which is why our third national planning framework identified new and expanded pumped storage facilities as a national development, and why we are seeking to work with the UK government and industry to consider how pumped storage can be supported in the future. Jill McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Institute of Mechanical Engineers estimate that 3.4 gigawatts of energy storage will be needed in Scotland by 2020, but current storage capacity is little over 0.75 gigawatts, and as he says, it's largely pumped storage. A number of companies are developing technologies such as liquid air battery storage, at the and the former nuclear power station at Chapel Cross is being suggested as a possible site for these kind of developments. Does the government agree with me that such projects should be encouraged, particularly as a way to make the most of Scotland's renewable energy resources. Minister. Well, yes, I do. And I, I met the member and uh, one of the individuals involved regarding the Chapel Cross proposal. And since then, Scottish Enterprise, on the 17th of November, is having a follow-up meeting. On the general point, uh, there is uh, potential pump storage capacity uh, of over two gigawatts at the moment. But what there is not is a route to make that happen under electricity market reform. The EIM proposals are entirely devoid of any mechanism to bring forward pump storage. This is entirely wrong. And that's why I support Scottish Renewables' proposal that there should be established a Scottish and UK government intergovernmental panel, a proposal that I put to the UK Energy Minister on the 13th of November, and to which a reply is currently awaited. That ends general questions before.